The most important question we can ask about a person is what motivates him or her? What are the principles upon which the person builds their life? What are they willing to die for? Today, it is my honor to present the Defender of Israel Award to two persons whose lives are built on Zionism, on their love of the land and the people of Israel. Miriam Fould is with us today to remember her husband, Ari Fould, who earned the nickname, the Lion of Israel. Ari Fould was born in New York and made Aliyah in 1994. He defended Israel as a soldier of the IDF. He served in Lebanon and served proudly in the IDF reserves. He was an assistant director of Standing Together. He would go anywhere in any situation to bring snacks and encouragement to Israeli soldiers on assignment. Ari defended his home, community of Afrat. As the commander of the anti-terrorism first responder team, he was always on call to protect his country and to support her defenders. Ari became world famous for his work as a public speaker and on social media. His Facebook and YouTube post with on-the-spot videos and Ari's facts-based clear arguments made the irrefutable case for the right of Jews to build and inhabit every inch of their national homeland. He took on the Israel haters, the historical revisionists, and the anti-Semites with a fierce dedication to truth. Thousands of people followed him on social media and learned how to advocate for Israel themselves. In everything Ari did, he had the loving and selfless support of Miriam and their four children. On September 16th, 2018, Ari was on, excuse me, at the shopping mall at the Gush Itzion Junction. A Palestinian teenager stabbed Ari in the back and then ran toward a nearby falafel shop, threatening the waitress there. Ari ran after the assailant and shot and injured him before collapsing. Ari fought to his last breath and saved the life of the waitress in his living and in his dying. Ari fooled demonstrates his Zionism, his incredible dedication to his country. It is an honor to recognize Ari and to present his wife Miriam with the Defender of the Israel Award in his memory.
Please, <clears throat> please welcome to the stage Mrs. Miriam Fool. Good evening, Shavua Tov. I would like to thank the RJC and especially Mr. Stephen Meisel for honoring Ari with this award. I would also like to thank David Orlin of the Stephen Meisel Foundation for his endless explanations and considerations of my feelings and emotions when booking me for this event. My name is Miriam Folt. I stand before you today as an American and an Israeli, a proud Jew, a wife, a mother, now also a mother-in-law and a grandmother. I stand before you as a widow. I would like to acknowledge my husband, Ari. If he were alive, I would not be here with you today, and he would still be out there defending the Jewish people and spreading the words of truth in the world. A little over four years ago, on September 16, 2018, two days before Yom Kippur, Ari was walking through a parking lot on his way to the supermarket when a 16-year-old Arab jumped out from between the cars and stabbed Ari in the back. The wound was lethal, but Ari, sensing danger to others, turned and started to chase his attacker, who was running towards the entrance of the mall with intent to wound and kill more. Ari managed to shoot and wound the terrorist, and only when he saw only when he saw others holding the terrorist down at gunpoint and knew no one else was going to get hurt, did Ari allow himself to fall and rest. Ari's wounds were too severe. The knife had sliced into his lung and severed his artery. He had lost too much blood and died on the way to the hospital. Ari's actions are a lesson to us all. Ari died the way he lived, fighting for justice and protecting his fellow man, fighting for truth and protecting Israel. Ari was killed by a terrorist who knew nothing but hatred for Jews. He had no respect for a fellow human being. He knew nothing of the sanctity of life. Ari and I, living in Israel, raise our children to be proud Jews proud defenders of our country and of our people, to respect others, and most important, to know that human life is sacred. We raise them to be good people, good Jews, living and loving Israel. That is Ari's true legacy, and it lives on through them. Ari constantly tried to inspire others to teach them about Israel, about the Jewish people, about our courage and our greatness. I'm not a very good public speaker. That was Ari's job. So I try to use Ari's words to spread the truth and to remember him. In one of Ari's posts in response to a terrorist attack of a stabbing of a young woman, Ari reaches out to people abroad and he says, our goal is simple, not allowing terrorism to win. Terrorism is not about killing people. It's about causing terror, causing fear. Stand with our, your people. Stand with Israel. Don't give up on us. Don't give up on yourselves. Life goes on, and we get stronger. Ari was a proud Jew, proud of his people, and proud of his country. Ari never apologized for who we are, for what we are. That is Tzionut Amitit, true Zionism. Ari served in the Israeli Defense Forces until the day he died, and he wore his uniform with pride. Ari knew what it meant to fight for something you believe in, to defend a country you love, to protect your people and your nation. Ari taught and inspired so many people, and in the four years since he was so brutally taken from this world, Ari has inspired even more people to take action and to fight for what they believe in. 
The Ari Fold Project was established to continue the mission Ari began and never gave up trying to complete, even with his dying breath, to defend Israel and the Jewish people, to help and support IDF soldiers, and to teach others about the beauty and depths of Judaism and Israel. You can visit arifold.org for information on ongoing projects and how to help keep Ari's legacy alive. Thank you this evening for honoring and remembering Ari. He was a true defender of Israel and the people. Am Yisrael Chai. Thank you, Miriam. In Israel, young men and women joined the Israel Defense Forces right out of high school to fulfill their compulsory military service. They serve for two or more years and then most return to civilian life and enter the IDF reserves. For a few weeks each year, these reservists must leave their families and jobs to continue protecting their homeland and its people. In his civilian life, Aviad Moskowitz works as a designer on a high-tech company and lives with his wife and two children on a moshav in the south of Israel. But for more than a decade, Aviad has been serving in the IDF reserves to Battalion 21. As a platoon sergeant in the combat unit, he helps lead his company and prepare the men for the challenges they face on duty as they step away from their daily routines to serve. Last January, Aviad and his men were deployed in an area in the central West Bank that had seen rising violence against Israelis. They were guarding a bus stop when a Palestinian man got out of a car at the stop and attempted to stab the soldiers. Aviad's team opened fire neutralizing the attacker and preventing him from carrying out his murderous plans. Aviad's team acted immediately and courageously to stop an active threat and save the lives of the soldiers and civilians around him. We are pleased tonight to honor Aviad on behalf of the Reserve Battalion 21 for their courage and dedication. Please welcome to the stage Aviad Maskowitz. Thank you, Mr. Mizell for this honor and for shining a light on the actions of the men and women who show up for reserve duty and put themselves in the line of fire to defend Israel and all our citizens. When we show up for reserve duty and put on our uniforms, we're transformed, in a way, back to our younger selves. Our training comes back after a short refresher course. We also return to the camaraderie and the clarity of purpose of the IDF to defend Israel's citizens and preserve peaceful life in the region. We embrace and catch up with our brothers who we have known for years and whom we've trained, bled, and defended our country together. We prepare ourselves for the coming weeks of duty by training and familiarizing ourselves with the mission at hand. Then, shortly after leaving home, we're geared up and at our posts or on patrol. 
immersed in the work of defending our people. Then we receive a call from our children or a message from work and our lives of family and civilian lives flood in. We compartmentalize this so that we can be at our highest level of alertness because in just a matter of seconds, a terror attack can happen. And it is on us and other soldiers like us to be ready at any given moment to make sure that we react with speed and exactness to ensure that the citizens that we are there to protect remain unharmed. I'm happy to say that we were able to achieve this last January. Our team positioned themselves in a strategic place where they were able to assess any imminent threat. As it happened, a terrorist armed with a knife attempted an attack at a bus stop, and our team acted with extreme haste to neutralize the attack. The reality of life in Israel is that attacks can happen at any time, and our citizen army must be on alert at all times. And so we are. I, it's our duty and our pride to defend our country. I accept this award on behalf of my team, all of Gdud Islim Echad, or Battalion 21, and all the men and women that put aside their civilian lives to continue to stand and defend our people and our land. Thank you. It is my honor to present these awards which read on behalf of the Republican Jewish Coalition we proudly present this Defender of Nation Israel Award in recognition and gratitude for your courage and dedication to defending Israel and to its people. This award is funded by the Stephen Meisel Foundation. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, we kindly ask to take your seats. Our program is going to begin very shortly. Thank you.
taking the oath of office to become the first woman to serve as governor of South Carolina. I think my differences have always had people underestimate me. And I think that's the fun I have, is in going and proving them wrong. When a challenge comes in, I'm so overprotective of the state that I just, I just work. That's all I know to do is work. And I don't stop until I feel like things are taken care of. If you can give a person a job, you take care of a family. And we watched a lot of families get taken care of over the past couple years. President-elect Trump has asked South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley to be his ambassador to the United Nations, and she's accepted. The daughter of Indian immigrants is considered a rising star in the Republican Party. Haley would be the first woman appointed to Trump's cabinet. For anyone that says you can't get anything done at the UN, they need to know there's a new sheriff in town. There is a new U.S. UN. You are going to see a change in the way we do business. For those who don't have our back, we're taking names. If for any reason North Korea attacks the United States or our allies, the U.S. will respond. Period. She's so tough and she's so consistent. And you just know you're not going to move her. America will put our embassy in Jerusalem. That is what the American people want us to do. And it is the right thing to do. No vote in the United Nations will make any difference on that. What we witnessed here today in the Security Council is an insult. It won't be forgotten. I like the message that Nikki sent yesterday at the United Nations. This was the finest hour for Nikki Haley, I think. Standing up for the United States, standing up for Israel. Standing her ground, UN Ambassador Nikki Haley making it clear. I will not shut up. Rather, I will respectfully speak some hard truths. Nikki Haley delivered absolute wow. fire and brimstone. She dropped it right on the head of the Russian ambassador. Ambassador Nikki Haley, who is really going after the Russians, she, she gives the evil eye. So Haley shows us what American foreign policy looks like with a spy. I wear heels. It's not for a fashion state. It's because if I see something wrong, we're going to kick them every single time. We have to put forth real solutions to our country's problems, and we have to restore the people's belief that America is worth fighting for. America is the greatest force for good in human history, and we should never be ashamed to say that. The biggest reason socialism is gaining ground is because capitalism's defenders are too afraid to speak up. We can't keep quiet. The truth matters, and it's time to tell it. America is too nice, too nice. Stop being nice to these thugs and these tyrants that want to kill us. We're not going to throw cotton balls at them. We're going to throw a grenade. Here's what I just learned. Don't make Nikki Haley mad. And if this president signs any sort of deal, I'll make you a promise. The next president will shred it on her first day in office. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ambassador. Thank you so much. It's great to be back at the RJC and to all of you, Shavua Tov. The Republican Jewish Coalition has always had a special place in my heart for many reasons. We get each other on a personal level. We know what it's like to be pushed around, but we also know what it means to push back. And right now, America needs leaders who aren't afraid to fight for what is right. We just lived through a disheartening election. It should be a wake-up call for all of us. 
We have to stop losing and start winning. And we have to choose candidates that can win not just a primary, but also a general election. We don't need more politicians who love to go on TV and talk about our problems. We need real leaders with a record of delivering solutions, the kind of leader that will do the hard work and get the results that we need. We did that when I was governor of South Carolina. We did that when I was UN ambassador. And between us, I'm just getting started. We need to acknowledge what went wrong on November 8th. But first, I want to talk about what went right. Despite the headlines, we cleaned up in a lot of states. Look at Florida. I'm glad to be joined tonight by Governor Ron DeSantis. He's doing great things, and he earned his victory. But don't listen to the media. Florida is far from the only bright spot that we had. Brian Kemp handily defeated Stacey Abrams in Georgia. Greg Abbott kicked, kicked Beto O'Rourke to the curb in Texas. And then there's Iowa. The good people of the Hawkeye State flipped the attorney general seat. The state treasurer both 40-year incumbents in those races. And at the top of the ticket, Governor Kim Reynolds won in a historic victory, shepherding every single congressional race and picked up multiple state house races. These leaders won because they actually led. They fought for the people in their states. Over the past few months, my political organization and I endorsed 60 candidates. We did over 80 campaign events. We, do, we raised $10 million that went straight into those candidates' campaign accounts. And we had a great time working with the RJC in Nevada and Texas. Like all of you, it was disheartening to see some of our candidates lose. But I disagree that our losses were due to one person. I, I also disagree that we had bad candidates. We fell short for a number of reasons. First, our candidates were completely outraised. The Democrats blew us out of the water when it came to fundraising, and it's why we lost the messaging wars. Secondly, we were completely outplayed electorally. The Democrats did a full court press to vote early. We sat on our hands. Friends, early and absentee voting are here to stay. We need to play the same game and turn out the maximum number of voters. The left does it and we don't. And finally, we, need, we were completely outfought politically. The Democrats were unified. They had their eye on the ball. Even the squad stayed silent. But Republicans spent as much time fighting each other as we did the Democrats. It is time to quit eating our own. The truth is, Americans weren't trusting the state of our party. They don't want chaos. They want strength and stability and unity. We didn't have that. We have to look in the mirror. The Republican Party has lost the popular vote in the last seven out of eight presidential elections. That's saying something. We're behind the times, and we have to be honest with ourselves. Joe Biden turns 80 years old tomorrow. Happy birthday, Mr. President, but it's time for a younger generation to lead across the board. Our failure on Election Day has a terrible cost. When we lose, the Democrats win. And when the Democrats win, America loses. 
Look at our economy. Biden inflation is crushing families. It costs more at the pump, and that's how we get to work. It costs more at the grocery store, and that's how we feed our families. Families are spending $5,000 more this year than they spent last year on the exact same things. When Michael and I were raising our kids, do you know where we would have gotten that money from? A credit card. That's what's happening in middle America right now, and interest rates are going up. People are suffering. 30% of Americans have dipped into their savings account. 60% of Americans are now in credit card debt. A third of our small businesses couldn't pay rent in October. Our small businesses are the heartbeat of our economy. This is a crisis, but the Republican Party knows the solutions that will get us back on track. We need to cut wasteful spending. We need to cut taxes. We need to pump more oil and gas than we ever have before. <clears throat> and we don't need Washington paying people to sit on the couch. We put those same solutions to work in South Carolina. When I came into office, our unemployment rate was 10.8%. And South, Carolina, South Carolinians were tired of being the butt of the jokes. Prior years, all of the eggs in South Carolina had been put in the textile basket. And when textile manufacturing went overseas, so did all of our jobs. So when I came in, we knew we had to recruit. And I didn't want to recruit companies from other states. That was too easy. I wanted to recruit companies from overseas because I wanted to make things in America again. And what... We retrained our workforce and we taught them skills. Our citizens started believing in South Carolina again, and more importantly, they started believing in themselves again. And it worked. We made South Carolina number one in foreign investment in the entire country. And by the time I left, we were building planes with Boeing. We were building more BMWs than any place in the world. We had recruited Mercedes-Benz, Volvo. We had five international tire companies, and our unemployment had hit a 15-year low. They were referring to us as the beast of the Southeast, which I loved. If we can do that in South Carolina, we can do that in all of America. And parents know that we need to fix our education. Everyone wants to blame COVID for the terrible failure of our schools, but our schools were a disaster before the pandemic ever hit. Pre-COVID, 65% of fourth graders in our country were not proficient in reading. 66% of eighth graders weren't proficient in reading or math. Now the situation's even worse. Our kids have experienced the largest decline in three decades. Ready for this? Now 70% of eighth graders in our country are not proficient in reading. And we saw the largest drop in math scores ever. Do you really think we'll beat China if our kids can't read, write, or do simple math? As parents, we have one job, one job, and that's to make sure our kids get a good education. Parents know what their children need. We have to have school choice in our country. It's racist that the Democrats think that minorities are incapable of picking the schools for their children. We are perfectly capable of picking our schools for our children. And there are so many other problems to solve. We need to end the crime wave and back the blue. We need to secure our border and build the wall. America is a country of laws, and it's time every criminal knew it. And of course, we need to restore our faith in our elections. Someone should teach Arizona, Nevada, and California how to run an election. We deserve to know the results on Election Day, not Thanksgiving. And we need even more election integrity because it works. 
Remember how, Demo how Democrats said Georgia's new voter law was Jim Crow 2.0? Well, guess what? Georgia is getting record turnout records. I pushed for voter ID in South Carolina back in 2011. I was vilified for it. They said I was disenfranchising voters. And I said, if you've got to show a picture ID to buy Sudafed, if you've got to show picture ID to get on a plane, you should have to show picture ID to protect the integrity of the election process. And I said, but I hear you. So if you think we're disenfranchising voters, anyone that needs an ID, we will pick them up, we will take them to the DMV, we will give them a free ID, and we will return them home safely. <laughs> Out of five million people in South Carolina, you know how many people asked for a ride? 25. We passed voter ID in South Carolina, and now we have more people voting in South Carolina than ever before. And yes, we have our election results on election night. We need to be strong at home, but we need to be strong in the world. I know what American leadership looks like, and it is the opposite of what Joe Biden is doing. Look at how this president has treated Israel. The Jewish state doesn't even know if we have her back anymore. Israel shouldn't have to wonder whether America stands with her after every election. I was proud to stand up to the bullies and the haters of Israel in the UN. It was the right thing to do. But standing up to Israel should never be partisan. And I'm proud to say I was the first governor in America to sign a law banning BDS. We're up to 35 states and counting. Supporting Israel shouldn't be hard. Neither is standing up to Iran. But Joe Biden doesn't get that. He spent most of the past two years trying to rejoin the Iran deal. Iran wouldn't even allow us in the negotiating room. Do you know who the lead negotiator was? Russia. Think about that. We're having one enemy negotiate with another enemy for us. That's lunacy. That's not leadership. We all know what Iran wants. The regime tells us all the time, death to America, death to Israel. And it wants nuclear weapons to make good on that promise. A bad deal with Iran makes that more likely, not yet, not less. And if Biden succeeds in getting back in the Iran deal, I will make you a promise. I've said it before. The next president will shred it on her first day in office. Lots of our crises wouldn't exist if we wouldn't have had the debacle in Afghanistan. Pulling out of Afghanistan wasn't the problem. The problem was how Joe Biden did it. He threw away two decades of sacrifice and humiliated our country. Thirteen heroic service members lost their lives because Biden surrendered. As the wife of a combat veteran who deployed in Afghanistan, it was sickening to watch. And it was a slap in the face to my husband, Michael, and his military brothers and sisters who served there. To think that Biden had America leave Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that told our friends. More importantly, think about what that told our enemies. It said, when in danger, America can't be trusted. Putin sure got the message. It's why he thought he could get away with the largest land war in Europe since World War II. America could have stopped that war before the shooting started. China got the message too. 
China is closer than ever to invading Taiwan. It's in the process of building military that rivals our own. And you want to know what our military is doing? Gender pronoun classes. <laughs> and what's Joe Biden doing? He's trying to negotiate a climate deal with China. We have to snap out of it. China is our number one national security threat. We should be standing up to China, not begging them to recycle more. We should be making our military stronger than ever. My brother served in Desert Storm and my husband in Afghanistan. I know the sacrifice military families endure. Believe me when I say, I want peace. And that's why I want to renew our strength. A strong America doesn't start wars. A strong America prevents wars. American leadership is needed now more than ever. Terrorists are on the march. Russia is invading its neighbors. A communist superpower is trying to bury us. And America is falling behind. We look so distracted right now. And when America is distracted, the world is less safe. The world hasn't been this dangerous since the 1970s. But if we get focused, humble, and disciplined, we can make sure Joe Biden follows in the footsteps of Jimmy Carter. Like Jimmy, we'll make sure Joe is a one-term president. We have the right policy solutions, but the biggest threat we face isn't really about policy at all. It's about our fading national pride. There is a national self-loathing that is sweeping across America, and it's worse than any pandemic by far. My love of America is one of the driving forces in my life. At the UN, I dealt with plenty of countries that hate America, and proving them wrong was the best part of my job. But I never expected to see that same hatred coming from our fellow Americans. We now have self-loathing in the classroom, the boardroom, the media green room, and the back rooms of government. We see it in riots on our street and censorship in big tech. And we see it at every level of the Democratic Party, all the way up to Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. The Democrats of today no longer want a colorblind society. Just the opposite. They want to judge people based on the color of their skin. And they have the gall to tell us America is racist. My parents taught me better. They came from India with $8 in their pockets. We were the only Indian family in a small rural southern town. We weren't white enough to be white. We weren't black enough to be black. They didn't know who we were, what we were, or why we were there. But my parents knew. And there wasn't a day they didn't remind my brothers, my sister, and me that even on our worst day, we are blessed to live in America. This crisis of self-loathing will destroy us if we let it. We have to start a loving America. We have to start loving America once again. And we have to teach our kids and our grandkids that America deserves their love. I'm not afraid to tell the real story of America. It's the story of Abraham Lincoln, Frederick Douglass, and the abolitionists who ended slavery. It's the story of Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and the suffragettes who made women's rights a reality. It's the story of Martin Luther King Jr. who told us his dream and saw it become real at the end of segregation. And I've seen this story in my own life and in my time as governor. When a black man named Walter Scott was murdered by a dirty cop, we didn't have riots. Instead, we passed the first body camera bill in the country protecting our citizens and our good cops. When a sick and twisted man murdered nine amazing souls at Mother Emanuel Church, we didn't have chaos, we had vigils. 
And as the first female governor of South Carolina and the first minority female governor in the United States, I will say until my last breath, America is not a racist country. America is a blessed country. This is the story we have to tell. This is the story we have to continue. If Republicans don't, no one will. But first, we've got some real work to do. It's time to make some hard choices and confront hard truths. It's time for some honest soul searching. After the midterms, I'm more determined than ever to fight with everything I've got to bring strength back to our country. We can't allow ourselves to fall short again. Now's the time to expand the tent. We have to reach out to younger generations. We have to reach out to Hispanics, to Asians, to African Americans, to the Jewish community, and yes, to women. It will, it will make us a stronger and better party, and it actually reflects what we believe. The Republican Party is the only party that believes in lifting up everyone, not just a select few. A lot of people have asked if I'm going to run for president. Now that the midterms are over, I'll look at it in a serious way, and I'll have more to say soon. If my family and I decide to continue our life of service, we will put a thousand percent into it and we'll finish it. For now, I'll say this. I've won tough primaries and tough general elections. I've been the underdog every single time. When people underestimate me, it's always fun. But I've never lost an election and I'm not going to start now. I'm ready for the road ahead. As a brown girl growing up in a small rural southern town, I saw the promise of America before me. As the proud wife of a combat veteran, I saw our people's deep love of freedom and determination to defend it. As governor of South Carolina, I saw our state move beyond hate and violence and lift up everyone in peace. And as ambassador, I saw that America is still the standard. When we speak, the world listens. Where we lead, the world follows. Who we are, the world wants to be. I was reminded of America's special role every day at the United Nations. But one day stands out among the rest. It was a day I stood on the Simon Boulevard Bridge between Venezuela and Colombia. I watched thousands of Venezuelans walk holding their babies in the hot sun for hours just to get the one meal they might get that day. At that time, they were killing zoo animals for food. They were fleeing socialism, and they were searching for freedom. When I left the bridge, I went to a nearby shelter where the Venezuelans were gathering. After a few minutes, more and more families started to gather around me. I didn't understand why they flocked to someone they had never met. And then it hit me. They didn't care who I was. They cared where I was from. In me, they saw America. And in America, they saw hope. As Republicans and as Americans, it's up to us to renew that hope. Our children and our grandchildren are counting on us. And together, I know, we will come through for them in a way that makes everyone proud. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America.
together, we have made Florida the freest state in these United States. If they want to shut down businesses, you're damn right. I'm going to stand in the way. I'm going to stand with these folks here because they have a right to make a living. And I don't think government has a right to put these people out of work. The chance that I am going to back down from my commitment to students and back down from my commitment to parents' rights, the chances of that are zero. Will they ever retire? Dr. Fauci. If I had my druthers, you know, you take him and you chuck him across the Potomac. <laughs> it's a fake narrative. I just disabused you of the narrative and you don't care about the facts. I don't care what corporate media outlets say. I don't care what Hollywood says. I don't care what big corporations say. Here I stand. I'm not backing down. We are going to carry this torch of freedom onward because our mission is very simple. We are keeping the state of Florida free. Thank you all. God bless you. Ladies and gentlemen, Governor Ron DeSantis. much great to be back at the rjc and i just want to thank everybody because i know it was a night of uh underwhelming performances across the country in terms of these midterm elections but thanks to your support the state of florida delivered a true republican landslide we added four new Republican congressman to the U.S. House of Representatives from the state of Florida. We secured super majorities in the Florida legislature, the most Republicans we have ever had in Florida history. We helped elect 26 new conservative school board members all across the state of Florida. And we even won the state House seat that includes Miami Beach, not typically viewed as a Republican stronghold. And because of the support of so many of you uh, to our campaign, we delivered the greatest gubernatorial victory in the history of the state of Florida. We dominated with independent voters. We secured record margins with Hispanic voters. We swept the suburbs all across the state of Florida. Our margins with rural voters were gravity defying. We won by double digits Miami-Dade County. We won for the first time in almost 40 years Palm Beach County. And we don't know precisely what the final number is, but we can say uh, that we won the highest share of the Jewish vote for any Republican candidate in Florida history. And look, uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. It's not just Jewish issues, it's everything we've done. But I will say, if you look at our record on issues related to Israel, and supporting the Jewish community, it is second to none. We, when I first became governor, one of the first things we did was fight back against Airbnb, who was discriminating against Israeli Jews, and we won that fight against Airbnb. We provided record financial support for security at Jewish day schools in Florida, and we've authorized emergency services with United Hatsala. We've enacted enhanced and robust Holocaust education standards because we know how important that is that we never forget. We sign legislation combating anti-Semitism. We are not going to allow 
the universities in the state of Florida to become hotbeds of anti-Jewish sentiment like they have all across this country. And we signed that bill on a trade mission to Israel at the American Embassy in Jerusalem. And on that trade mission, which we did, the biggest trade mission Florida's ever done, we were the first statewide elected official to do public events in Judea and Samaria. Because we understand history, we know those are thousands of years of connection to the Jewish people. And I don't care what the State Department says. They are not occupied territory. It is disputed territory. And you got to know the history. Which is one of the reasons why I was such a big advocate when I was a congressman of relocating America's embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. They said it would spark World War III, and they were wrong. It was the right thing to do. We also worked very hard to support recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights was the right decision to make. We opposed vociferously the Obama Hamani Iran nuclear deal, and we oppose any attempt by the Biden regime to reinstitute that or to do anything to help the Iranian regime. We were fortunate to be, when we did the trade mission to Israel, we brought people who had never been before. And I think those of you who have been able to take people for the first time, it's a unique experience because you're talking about thousands of years of history. A lot of the things people study comes to life. On one of the trips we took many years ago, my wife and I, Casey, who's actually here backstage, we happen to have a very good first lady in the state of Florida. We, she got brought home with us, and we didn't have kids at the time. She brought home uh, with us water from the Sea of Galilee. And the purpose was to use that to baptize any of the kids that we were planning on having. And so we brought the water back, had our daughter in 2016, did the baptism, used the water, worked very well. And this is just in like a normal plastic water bottle. Um, my son is born in 2018 during the governor campaign. Well, we were busy, so we said we got to get through the campaign. We'll do the baptism after that. Why not just do it on the day of the inauguration? So we went after I got inaugurated January 2019, went back to the governor's mansion, did his baptism with the water from the Sea of Galilee. However, however, we were not used to people picking up behind us. So we're here. We left a plastic bottle half filled with water out. We end up going to the inaugural ball. The next morning I wake up, I ask my wife, where is the Sea of Galilee water? I look downstairs. There was no plastic water bottles left. It was, it was dispensed with, which is fine. Well, about a week or two later, I happened to be down doing an event uh, with some of the Jewish community in Boca Raton. We went outside the synagogue after, the, uh, after we had our meeting, and I announced in front of the cameras, we don't have a bun in the oven, but... We are out of water from the Sea of Galilee. So if we have another one, we're going to need it. Within 24 hours, there were people in Israel digging in the Sea of Galilee, <laughs> sending water back. And I wasn't going to leave it in like a little Zephyr Hills bottle. We added a nice big glass jar, sat on my desk in the state capitol, and we had our third child in March of 2020, and I did not touch that water until we used it for her baptism a few months later. So, I think what the election results in Florida show is, you know, Florida really has a blueprint for success. And I think some of the things that we do that work are, uh, we're all about exercising leadership and delivering results for the people that we represent. I did not take any polls when I became governor all the way through this entire term. The job of a leader is not to stick your finger in the wind and try to contort yourself to wherever uh, public opinion may be trending on one given moment. No, the job of a leader is to set out a vision 
uh, to execute that vision, uh, to show people that it's the right vision, and to deliver concrete results. And when you do that, uh, the people respond. And boy, on November 8th, did they ever respond in the state of Florida. And so if you think about some of the things that, that we do that maybe some others don't, yeah, I was up campaigning for Lee Zeldin, who did a great job. Tough state, very tough state. Honestly, if so many Republicans hadn't moved to Florida over the last four years, he probably could have won. Uh, that's just the nature of it. So if you compare New York to Florida, they have three, like we have millions of more people in Florida now than in New York, yet their budget is over twice the size of our budget in Florida. But when New Yorkers move down, they'll tell me, Man, your roads are better, infrastructure's better, services are better, and we have higher performing K-12 and higher education public as well, and we have no income tax, second lowest tax burden in the country, record $22 billion surplus. They tax people and tax people and tax. Where is all the money going uh, that they're doing? We respect taxpayers in the state of Florida. We want people to succeed. Uh, we're happy to have people come and start businesses. That's why we've led the country uh, in the last few years in new business formations, even more, many more than California, who's twice our size in terms of population. People understand uh, about good management. And then just think about, we had a major hurricane come through in September, Hurricane Ian. Uh, we had 42,000 linemen stationed before landfall to help restore power. Millions of people had power knocked out, and it was the fastest power restoration after a major hurricane in Florida history. We had search and rescue launched immediately, thousands of rescue missions done within a matter of days. Uh, but one of the things that happened was the storm knocked out a bridge going to one, uh, an island called Pine Island, and it knocked out the causeway in Sanibel in three different locations. Now, these are not state bridges. They're not state roads. But they came to me and said, can you help? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, we're going to help. So we looked at the bridge, and we said, okay, what are our options? No red tape, no bureaucracy. Get it done. Time is of the essence. Uh, we undertook the mission. Uh, three days later, we reconnected the bridge and opened it back to Pine Island. Now... If you think some of these other states that are always bogged down in bureaucracy and red tape would have been able to get that bridge up and running in three days, uh, I got oceanfront property in Arizona. I would like to sell you, so please come talk to me. Of course that wouldn't happen. And then if you look at what happened on election week, the day before the election, I had to declare a state of emergency because we had a hurricane approaching Florida, which became Hurricane Nicole. So we declared the state of emergency. Local uh, uh, counties start to prepare for, for impact. We conduct the election the next day on the Tuesday, count like 7.7 .7 million votes, report all the results out. Wednesday, I'm in the emergency operations center. Storm comes Wednesday night, Thursday morning, does damage. We have a coastal highway, A1A, that was knocked out in three different counties in different parts. We sent emergency crews to do emergency repairs. By Saturday afternoon, all the roads had been repaired. And a lot of these states are still haven't finished counting their votes from the election. What kind of a, a system is that? We know how many people have voted when the polls close. We know how many votes are outstanding. You count the votes, you report the results, and then you move on. You don't take a week to count. You don't have dumps coming in where you don't even know where these votes came from. So if people want to know how to conduct elections, look what Florida does. We've made ballot harvesting a third-degree felony in Florida. We've banned Zuckerbucks in the state of Florida. We have an elections crime unit now so that if you're voting illegally, you will actually be prosecuted and people have been brought up on charges who voted and weren't even American citizens. And so that's the things you need to do. And so I hope some of these other people get with the program. But here's the deal. If they have ballot harvesting, then Republicans need to do this too. You can't just let them do it and then us sit there with two hands tied behind our back. So whatever the rules are, take advantage of that. 
Now, one of the reasons why Florida has done well is because over the last few years, we stood out uh, as the free state of Florida. We, we refuse to let the state of Florida descend into some type of Faucian dystopia where people's freedoms were curtailed and their livelihoods were destroyed. No, we believed in lifting people up. We believed in protecting rights. We believed in saving thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs, saving businesses and making sure the kids could go in school. Now, every decision we made on that, uh, we were attacked by corporate media in Florida and throughout the country and even throughout the world. We were attacked by the left. We were attacked by the Democratic Party. Uh, but, you know, uh, the job of a leader is to take the arrows so that his people doesn't have to. So I always said throughout all that, I am much more worried about protecting the jobs of the people that I represent than I'm worried about saving my own. Let the politics sort itself out. I am totally fine with receiving this incoming fire because I'm standing for the people that I represent and I am saving their jobs, their businesses, and their kids' education. And that is the most important thing to do. So we attracted people from all over the country and all over the world. We were a refuge of sanity when the world went mad. We were the nation's citadel of freedom. Indeed, we had people come from other countries, Canada, Australia, just wanting to come to Florida. When they left some of those restrictive jurisdictions, they felt like it was arriving in West Berlin from East Berlin. It was that, that dramatic. And we were happy to have done that. We banned vaccine passports in the state of Florida. We refused, we refused to let anybody lose their job over a decision to take a COVID shot. And we passed legislation to protect. And we also prohibited any mandates for COVID shots on school children. That is a parent's decision. It cannot be mandated. So we had to make decisions. Others had to make decisions. The state of Florida, we chose freedom over Fauciism, and we are better off for having done that. We also have chosen law and order over rioting in disorder. When you had the riots break out in 2020, I called out the National Guard immediately in the state of Florida. We had state law enforcement ready to go. We were not going to let the state of Florida burn to the ground like so many other cities across this country. We made sure to enact legislation thereafter that prohibits local governments from defunding the police in the state of Florida. And in fact, we're funding and then some. We're making sure that if people are engaged in rioting and looting and that type of conduct, they're not getting treated like they do in Portland where they get a slap on the wrist and they get put right back on the street. In Florida, you do that, you're not getting a slap on the wrist. You are getting the inside of a jail cell because we are going to hold you accountable for your conduct. We reject prosecutors who get elected and then pick and choose which laws they want to enforce. And we've seen this in Los Angeles. We've seen it in San Francisco. We've seen it in Manhattan. And in Florida, when we had a prosecutor say he wasn't going to enforce laws he didn't like, I removed him from his post. <laughs> the state of Florida has chosen education over indoctrination. We believe in supporting the rights of parents to play a fundamental role in the education and upbringing of their, of their children. We support parental choice in education and have expanded private scholarships to almost 200,000 students throughout the state of Florida, the most in the United States. We reject, we reject having our schools be a tool for ideology and therefore have banned critical race theory in our K through 12 schools. We are not going to use tax dollars to teach our kids to hate this country or to hate each other. No, we are going to teach about the United States Constitution. We're going to teach about the Bill of Rights. We're going to teach kids what it means to be an American, but we're going to teach the truth 
and we're going to teach accurate history. We also are going to stand with parents so that the, what's being taught in the kids' schools is appropriate for the ages. And we have had the fight to ban gender ideology in our elementary schools. It is wrong to teach a kid that they were born in the wrong body. It's wrong to teach a kid that their gender is a choice. And in the state of Florida, that will not happen. And even when you have the granddaddy of them all, Walt Disney Company opposing us, we didn't back down because we stand up for the rights of parents in Florida. We're not kowtowing to woke corporations. And the whole idea that you'd even be talking about things like gender ideology really shows the effects of what I call the woke mind virus that's running wild throughout so many institutions in society. We had, to, I had to sign a bill in 2021, I'm happy to do it, but I had to sign legislation protecting women's athletics in the state of Florida. It's the right thing to do. How is it that you have someone that will compete on the men's swim team for three seasons, then switch to the women's and somehow win the national championship for the women's? That is unfair to those women athletes who are training. They deserve an equal opportunity. And in Florida, that's exactly uh, what they're going to get. We reject woke ideology in the state of Florida. And we will fight it in the classrooms. We will fight it in the corporations. We will fight it in the halls of the legislature. We will never, ever surrender to the woke mob. The state of Florida is where woke goes to die. What we've shown in Florida is you can stand up for truth, you can stand on principle, you can fight the woke elite, and you can win. And I think this is important because the survival of the American experiment requires a revival of the enduring American principles uh, that make this country unique. And Florida's formula is everything we do is rooted in those founding principles of our country. We douse it with a very heavy dose of common sense, which is in very short supply nowadays. Uh, and we buttress that with having the courage to lead on issues uh, where you know you may get incoming fire. Uh, but that's the price of leadership nowadays. Anything you do uh, that's meaningful, you are going to have people that are going to shoot at you. They're going to take pot shots at you. They're going to criticize you. They're going to smear you. Uh, you got to be willing to stand strong. Uh, you got to be willing to take those hits and keep on going. And that's what we do in Florida each and every day. I don't think you can ever find a governor in history that has been attacked more than me for standing up for what's true. But guess what? When you stand up for what's right, when you show people you're willing to fight for them, they will walk over broken glass barefoot to come vote for you. And that's exactly what they did for me on November 8th in record numbers. But what we've shown is people respond to strong leadership. If you look at our election results, we had the biggest election margin, 1.5 million votes than any governor has had in the history of the state of Florida. If you look at who we were winning, we were winning across the board. You don't get that type of victory only getting Republicans. What we did is we had a great Republican turnout, very energized, base of supporters, but we also decisively won the middle. We won more Democrats than any governor has done for a long time. We were winning people regardless of these boxes that the media always wants to put people in. We treated people as individuals and as fellow Americans, and they responded. So you can be strong, you can get things done, and you can attract a huge, huge coalition. Because I think most people realize there's a lot that's gone wrong in our country, particularly over the last two years. Florida really is showing a way out of this morass and this mess. Uh, but you got to be willing to do it, and you got to be successful in implementing it. And in times like these, there is no substitute for victory. We in Florida are the light. Freedom will reign supreme 
with Florida leading the way. I want to thank each and every one of you for your support. We've accomplished more over a four-year period than anybody thought possible. But I can tell you this, we've got a lot more to do, and I have only begun to fight. Thank you all. God bless you. Please welcome back RJC CEO Matt Brooks. Hello! Oh, thank you, Jimmy! You want a selfie? Wow, right? Wow. A lot of talk. There's a lot of talk about 2024. And I want to make one prediction for all of you in this room. And I don't usually make political predictions, but I want to make one tonight. And this prediction you can take to the bank. On the program yesterday and today, you saw the next president of the United States. One of the people who spoke to us today will be in the White House in 2024. So last year I got up at the end of the program and I asked everybody, I said to everybody, I'm glad you had a good time. We're going to work to make this year better than last year. How did we do? How did we do? Is it better than last year? Excellent. Now, the reason it's so good is because we have the most incredible staff of any organization in the Jewish world, the political world, uh, that exists. And I am blessed. And I just wanted to take a moment because, as you can imagine, there are so many moving pieces and so many moving parts to pulling these things off. And the dedication and the hard work of the staff makes us all look really good. And so I hope you appreciate it. If you see a staff member, please thank them. Where's our students? I want to point out these students because, to me, this lifts my spirit. We are blessed to have the support of Alan and Deanna Alavi, who have underwritten bringing the future generation. We talk so much about what's happening in the college campuses. The Alavis put their money where their mouth is because they know that we can't win the hearts and minds of the next generation until we introduce them to the issues and the, and the uh, policies that we discussed here today. So he is integrating them year after year and the numbers grow and grow. And, and the Alavis, we are so grateful. Thank you for bringing the kids. It, it just lifts 
the entire spirit of this weekend, and we're grateful and we love you. Thank you so much. Now, politics is not done. We have a special runoff election coming up in Georgia. Let me tell you what the RJC is going to do. We are deploying our entire national field staff, the people who were in Nevada, Pennsylvania, Florida. Uh, we had a field staff in Georgia already. We're all going to Georgia. We are going to deploy. We are going to door knock. We are going to turn out the Jewish vote. And if you're local and you want to come and volunteer and help us or come to, from Florida into Georgia or come anywhere into Georgia, we will put you to work phone banking uh, and, and turning out the vote for Herschel Walker because we need to win this Senate seat. We got one more in the tank, folks, one more in the tank, and we leave it on the field and we get Herschel Walker into the end zone. Now, if you're not from Georgia, if you're not from Georgia, there will be opportunities for you to help either by contributing financially to Herschel Walker's campaign or also volunteering time. So if you're in California or anywhere else in the country and you can't get to Georgia, we, you can, uh, we have the technology to allow you to do phone banking remotely from where you are into Georgia targeting the Jewish vote and we're going to make a difference. Now, having done all this heavy stuff over the last day or two, now's my favorite part of the program because you are in for an incredible treat. I have wanted for many years to have this gentleman come and, and perform for you tonight. Um, I am so, so excited. In the pantheon of entertainment superstars, there are but a handful of people who are known simply by their one name, Bono, Madonna, Share. Now we can't have afford we can't afford any of those, so they're not coming tonight. <laughs> but we got the next best thing. Um, this guy is going to blow you away. I guarantee you, you will fall on the floor laughing. He knows the Jewish community as well as anybody. Shines a light on it and makes us all laugh at ourselves and and all that's around us. So, without further ado, I am thrilled and honored. To bring him out, let's give a huge RJC welcome for Modi! How are you? Come on! Wow! What an event! As a comic, your biggest fear is, what do I open with? What am I going to open? What am I going to hit him with in the beginning? I want to thank Nikki Haley to give me my first joke. An 80-year-old man marries a 50-year-old woman on the wedding night. She says, Irving, come upstairs and make love to me. Irving says, I can't do both. Happy birthday to Joe Biden. He should be well and live long. And Governor DeSantis, wow. Come on, that was one of my best opening acts. One of my best opening acts. For him, I have a joke too. About a guy that runs to his rabbi and says, Rabbi, never believe what happened to me. My son left the house and became a Christian. The rabbi says, shh, never believe what happened to me. My son left the house too and became a Christian. Just so what do we do? We pray to God. They prayed to God and God answered and said, you never believe what happened to me? <laughs> now, I know we have non-Jews in the audience, so that was my way of saying thank you for coming. How great is it that this is not a fundraiser, but this is the fundraiser. Whenever you see me doing a show, it's a fundraiser. There's always, Jews love to raise money. We raise money for everything. Everything. Politics, hospitals, disease. Diseases love me the most. You find a good disease, they bring me right away. This is how the fundraiser usually works. They show a movie of a guy with a disease and then bring me on. Last week, I was in New Jersey for the New Jersey Diabetes 
They had a guy on the screen, I lost my sight, they took my toes up, there's a machine in my pancreas, and here's Modi. <laughs> during the pandemic, during the pandemic, we had the Zoom shows, still raising money. I was following guys that were on the respirator. <laughs> and here's Modi. We were ra the Zoom show, how great is it that's a live show? Let's thank God for that. We have a live show. No Zoom. Those Zoom shows were the most horrible thing in the world. You know, it's like being a comic doing a Zoom show, staring at a screen of Jewish women trying to figure out where they need Botox. <laughs> and a few weeks later, all the dermatologists and the plastic surgeons became essential workers. <laughs> and all the women came back like, mm -hmm. Zoom was the worst. Everything was on Zoom. Zoom school. Who here did Zoom school with their kids? Clap your hands. You are the heroes. You're the heroes. I watched my friends do Zoom school with their kids. I can't believe there wasn't a Zoom school shooting. Yeah, it's going to get a little edgier. One thing we all learned during the pandemic is that we all had way too many children. In the house, quarantining with them. Oh my God, there was, no, the fifth one was an option. But you have to understand something, my non-Jewish friends. When Jewish couples get married, the first advice they hit them with is, have your kids when you're young. Have your kids when you're young. This way later on you can have, but if you have your kids when you're young, that is the worst advice ever. Have your kids right before you die. That's when you should have your kids. Because your kids are only good to their 16, 18 max. When they love you. My mom is so beautiful. My dad is so smart. I love my parents. And then they just turn on you and blame you for everything wrong in their lives. So if you have your kids late in life, you don't give a damn. When they come home from college and say, Dad, I hate you. My psychiatrist said, because if you am codependent and I can't have a relationship, I absolutely hate you. You could just go, huh? Huh? What? Even if you don't have Alzheimer or dementia, fake it. Fake it. The kid comes home, I smashed the car, I've gone through all the money in the trust fund, I absolutely hate you. They used to have red jello here. Now it's green. Who are you? Hit your kids with who are you, just for fun. Friday night, turn to one of your kids and go, who are you? See how the vibe in the room just changes. We had speaker, we, we did honor two people today. It was amazing. Give another round of applause for that. But usually when Jews have a gathering like this, there's an honoree, there's always honorees. And I can smell the front table here. These are all honorees. You guys have all been honorees, right? My, my, my non-Jewish friends, I'm not going to lose you. When Jews get together, there's always an honoree. Honoree is the biggest schmuck the organization can find. Let's make him the honoree. He has a lot of money. People are going to, no one ever donates. He writes a check just to get the whole thing done. And then him and the rabbi for four hours are standing with a piece of Judaica in museum glass trying to figure out where they're going to take a picture with the wives. Then they make their speeches, the honoree speeches. You've been an honoree, so I can tell right away. Yes. But your wife grabbed the mic. The wife always grabs the mic for the honorary speeches. There's different categories. You have the young, the young professional award, the young chesed, the young charity award. It's a cute couple. She's still thin. He still has some hair. And they're kind of in love because they only have one kid. She comes on. <clears throat> it's such an honor to be receiving the Lador Vador Award. The Generation to Generation Award. I know we've only been in the community for just a year and a half, but you've all made us feel so welcome. 
I know it's got nothing to do with the fact that my husband's the number one hedge fund manager on Wall Street, and we're building a castle in the middle of the neighborhood. It should be called the Ayan Hara Award. The evil eye or a chut, poo on both of them, I hope they drop dead. The next honoree at these events is usually a woman who's a co-chair. She's co-chairing. Any co-chairs here? Yes. You never have to ask who the co-chair is because they will always tell you that they are the co-chair. I wasn't going to do it this year. Oh. But they begged me to say, here I am, my fifth year co-chairing. Oh. She makes her, her speech full of inside jokes that no one gets or cares about. As co-chair, I would feel remiss if I didn't thank my other co-chairs. <laughs> Stephanie, Steph, you are my partner in crime. When we decided to do a plated salad instead of a served salad, you spoke with the caterer, you put your foot down, you made it happen. The next honorees, whenever we raise money for a, uh, a Jewish school, they have a Parent of the Year Award. Parent of the Year. This, this, this is a woman who feels that the rabbi's words were not enough. She has to give us whatever she read on Chabad.org that week. In this week's parasha, weekly Torah portion, we read about the Maraglim, the spies, but some call them witnesses. I too feel as though I am a witness, a witness of Yiddishkeit. Every time I pick up my sons, Chase and August, from MTHA, Minimal Torah Hebrew Academy, and see them wearing their yarmulkes until they get in the car, I know I am seeing Am Yisroel Chai. And the names of these kids, Chase and August. Chase is a bank. And August is the name of a, of a kid who's the captain of the rowing team. Some kid from the middle of America, eight foot tall. Her kid's four foot one fat little thing. Ma, 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 ma because he didn't take his afternoon Ritalin booster. His name should not be August, it should be Mark Hezvin. Those of you who got that joke, enjoy it. The non-Jews, it's too deep. Oh, this is amazing. Oh my God, what the speakers we had here in the sound system, how good. Give me some, give me some, give me some, give me some, some sound here. Ah, ah, huh? Uh, the speakers came out. That's it. That's it. Thank you. Everybody came out here. The speaker, Israel and this and the election and we have. And then we had Friday night. They brought Elliot up here. Shalom he did hamotzi on a, on a challah the size of New Jersey. The poor guy. You cut the mic on him. What the hell? Ah. Uh, but let me tell you something. I, I discovered Florida during the pandemic. Yes. The, those of you from Florida, there was a pandemic. And we quarantined in the house. There was this whole thing with masks. And that's when I realized it was optional by moving to Florida. Florida is lit. I love your supermarket. Pubics. I love pubics. I'm in there watching the grandparents shop. And for some reason, the grandmother always brings the grandfather, right? I go, why do you bring him? She goes, I need Stanley to push the cart. Push the cart. It's a step, drag, step, drag, step, drag. And she leaves him in the middle of the produce aisle. Ah she goes to get what they need. He's sitting there. She disappears for 45 minutes. He starts looking for her. He's going, schlepping, dragging, schlepping, dragging. As he's going, he smashes into a guy looking for his wife. She says, what are you doing? She says, what are you doing? 
I'm looking for my wife. I'm looking for my wife. So what does your wife look like? You don't want to know what my wife looks like. She's gorgeous. It's a size two with tzitzka lechana, tuchas like you've never seen. What does your wife look like? He says, never mind. Let's go look for your wife. And Israel, this is the, 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 if you can read this room, it's all about Israel. All about Israel. Yeah. And there's nothing like when you do a fundraiser for Israel. Oh, whenever Israel has to do their fundraising, they do it in America. Because if they did it in Israel, they would make a dollar fifty. <laughs> so they do it all here. And they have their honoree, some woman who comes on from the organization. She comes on. Mm -mm. Shalom and hello. My name is Ayelet. Like I don't say it, Ayelet. Growing up in Israel, on kibbutz Ra'a, I never imagined I would be here today. Thanks to the organization Kids for Kids on Kibbutzim, or KKK, I'm not only here, it is also how I met my husband, Scott. <laughs> when Scott was doing his year on Kibbutz Ha Ra'a, which is north of nowhere in Israel, I saw him and right away I knew this is my ticket out of this desert. <laughs> we got married when I finished the army. I went from driving a tank to driving a Range Rover. But besides Florida, the Jews in New York also didn't really hold by the pandemic. I was doing shows May 2020. May 2020. I get a phone call from Hatsala. Does everybody know what Hatsala is? My non-Jewish friends, that's the, the Jewish Ambulance Corps. Yes, and now they're all turning. Why is there a Jewish Ambulance Corps? Because nobody else will pick us up. And you got to keep this in mind. I was in Manhattan quarantining eight, nine days in a row, not leaving my apartment. Wiping down my Oreos with Clorox because Dr. Fauci, you machimo, <laughs> had nothing else for us that week. So we were wiping our Oreos down with Clorox. And then I get a phone call from Hatsala to host a telethon in Crown Heights, the Wuhan of Brooklyn. We kept busy during the quarantine. We did this. I did this thing called 23 and Me. Clap hands if you've heard of it or done it. It's the ancestry test. It is the biggest waste of money you could ever do in your life. 23 and Me, your ancestry. And I was shocked my friends wanted to do it. In shock. Because my friends are the ones that are always like, you know, my security's being breached. My phone hears everything I'm saying. Which, by the way, is my favorite feature of the phone. If I need something, I grab my phone and think it into it. 16-inch toilet seat cover, off-white, oval. In two minutes, Home Depot sends you an ad. You hit the button. Somehow they already have your credit card on file. And before you go pissy again, it's on the toilet. So my friends, my friends who who, who were afraid of their security had no problem sending their DNA out all over the world to be uploaded to databases. And we got back the results and they were amazing. They were getting back these pie charts. One eighth Navajo Indian. <sighs> Two quarters Iberian, Celtic, Norwegian. I was so excited. I opened mine up, 99.8% Jewish. That was it. The pie chart was a matzo ball with a toothpick in it. The results came back in Yiddish. Then they give you your health risks. What am I? Is it, is it hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol? Nazis. Nazis are my number one health risk.
It actually said 99.8% Ashkenazi Jewish. Yes, which is probably this room. Where am I? For the non-Jews, I don't want to lose you. I know to you it's just the, the Jewish coalition, but Jewish has, it's like chicken. There's the white meat and the dark meat. <laughs> Sephardic, the dark meat, full of life and happiness, and the white meat. You see the woos? Where the Sephardic people? Sephardic, make some noise. Yes, yes, yes. That's Sephardic. This guy here, Ashkenazi, he hasn't wooed since the 80s. They're the ones that do everything with passion. Friday night, we make the blessing on the challah. Sephardic guys, it's an hour and a half event for them. Ashkenazi, two seconds. Hamoytzi lechemina. Done. Sephardic make hamoytzi. It is a nine-hour event. Poteach et yedecha. The guy's fainting. He keeps going. Then when they, then, then when they break the challah open, so far people rip the challah. This is for you. This is for you. I love you. This is a big piece. You're going to have a good week for you. Ashkenazi, we, we have a machete they would start doing surgery with. He's doing surgery. Suction. Salt. Someone bring me salt. Sephardic guys. Oh, Sephard, one thing you say about Sephardic people, they love their rabbi. You ever hear a Sephardic guy talk about his rabbi? This rabbi, special. He know Torah. He know the Gemara. He know all the books. We love this rabbi. Ashkenazi, what a schmuck. What a putz. Why is he in the board meeting? He's just a rabbi. And you should know I'm more of a rabbi than he'll ever be. Sephardi people, the Sephardi people schlep everything out. That you can say. They schlep everything out. In a, in a synagogue, the Sephardic synagogue, when they read the Torah, the Bible on Saturday, I'm not losing the non-Jews here. Ashkenazi read the Torah in seconds. Amen. Next. Why? We smell lunch downstairs. Sephardic read the Torah in actual time. You can almost see them going down the mountain. <laughs> Amen. Moshe. Sephardic people, the negotiations for shows, that's great. Whenever an organization that's Ashkenazi calls me up, how much is it for Marie to do a show for us? No. Absolutely not. He can't charge that much. All the money goes to the kids. It's non-profit. Sephardic negotiate different. How much you show? No. How many jokes we get for this price? Maybe you tell us, Joe, give us better price. One difference I recently found out about the Sephardics is that they named their kids after somebody who's still alive. I had no idea. Did you know this? I had no idea. I'm, with, I'm in a baby name. And the guy's like, I'm Joey. That's my son, Joey. That's Joey. And that's Joey. Ashkenazi, we name our children after someone who's dead and had the most horrible life in the world. <laughs> this child is barely born, and we have already assigned all of this baggage on him. This is my eldest son, Yaakov Yosef, named after my husband's great-grandfather, who was taken by the Russian army, imprisoned in Siberia, and tortured for 13 years. I'm like, oh my God, give the kid a chance. 
That's my daughter Rifki, named after my aunt that died of pneumonia at the age of nine. What the hell? You're killing her off at nine? Name your kids after somebody who had a good life. That's my son, Hugh Hefner. That's what you wish your kid. The man lived 93 years with a smile on his face every day of his life. That's what you wish. Not Chuni Ben Chachuchi from the Warsaw Chachuni. Hugh Hefner. Ah, oh, anti-Semitism. That was a topic here. Anti-Semitism. Hidden anti-Semitism. When you can't see it, that's the scariest. You guys are handling it with the universities and all that. Hidden. You know what I'm talking about? Hidden. And not when you see a guy with a yarmulke, you punch him. That's not original. That's not, that's, that's not hidden. Hidden anti-Semitism. Those COVID health questionnaires on your phone before you go in somewhere. You got to fill it. You know what I'm talking about? No, 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 no. I accept you go in. Has anybody ever read those questions? In the past 14 days... Have you felt achy and sneezing and a little nauseous and your ears are hurting and your back and your... Every Jew wakes up every morning with at least four COVID symptoms. <laughs> Sheila, does this smell right? Hidden anti-Semitism. Yes. Cancel culture is anti-Semitic. Yes. If someone says something bad against somebody who's Latino, Asian, black, trans, gay, done. They're finished. Finished. If someone says something bad against Jews, the worst, the worst that could happen is they make them visit a Holocaust museum. Which is the stupidest idea in the world. You're taking someone who hates Jews into a Holocaust museum they come out of there, wow! That was amazing! Get me a t-shirt, a hat, something! And why does the world hate us? Why? We're so tolerant. What are you laughing? We're, that, we're the most tolerant nation in the world. We are like, do your thing. I know why you're laughing. We're judgy. We're a little judgy. As a nation, all of you people here who are not Jewish, I want to tell you that every Jew in here at one point has had this thought. Can you believe their entire holiday is looking for an egg in the backyard? <laughs> That's how we view Easter, which begins at the same time as Passover. And you want to know how Passover starts? We're in our kitchen with the lights off, holding a candle, a feather, and a wooden spoon. Looking for a piece of bread that we hid. And whenever you tell the, 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 the crazy things that Jews do to people who aren't Jewish, they're so accepting, aren't they? Oh, wow, really? Wait, what? So... You take a chicken, you swing it over your head three times. All your sins go in the chicken. Genius. But whenever you explain the crazy things we do to Jews who are not that religious, they can't handle it. Wait, 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 The millennials are here. Where are the millennials? Clap your hands. What, the young, the, are, you, are you guys millennial or Gen Z? What are you? Gen Z too. You guys are. You, uh, I, I'm one of the only comics that is not crap on your, on your generation. I love millennials. I'm so happy to see you here. I love millennials. I even married one. But there is a generational differences between millennials and, and there's a gener, I don't know what it is. I'm going to tell you, I love cash. I love cash. I have cash on me always. All over the house, there's cash hidden everywhere. 
You guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, 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 old school, yes. And he doesn't get it. What's with the cash? I go, you got to have cash. Why? In case the Nazis come. He goes, we need cash for the Nazis. You can't Venmo the guard. It was that SS Schultz at thirdreich.gov with an open closed gate emoji? You got to have cash. How do, you, how do you tip people if you don't have cash? Not that I, not on the iPad when you get a coffee, you give an extra dollar. That's not a, that's, uh, I, I don't mean, t I mean schmear. Schmear. Unless you have cash, you can't schmear. I have a friend named Artie. We walk in a restaurant in New York. From the time we get to the, from the door to the table, he has handed out $100 to half the place. By the time we hit that table, anything worth eating in the restaurant has already arrived. Two Mexican waiters come over and start speaking Italian. Buonasera, signor Arturo. Come sta? Come by. Schmear. Millennials, you guys don't know how to tip or receive a tip. I'll give you an example. We, I was in Israel at the Kapinski Hotel, which is a Hebrew word that means overpriced for no reason. We get to the hotel, and we go to the pool. And the first thing you do when you get to the pool of an Israeli hotel is you schmear everybody. The security guard, so your friends can come visit, the wait staff, the this guy, every, the pool. There's always, some, there's always one guy at an Israeli pool with a suit, right? Amir. Take care of him. So we're there. And I'm telling you, millennials don't know how to tip. I gave, we were about to leave our last day. I said, Leo, go take care of the guy over there. He was our best friend. He was our waiter. Go take, and to watch him give him a tip was the most unsettling thing I ever saw in my life. He walks over. Thank you very much for always making sure we had our table and we always had a chairs and the towels were always there, that the guy with the watermelon always came to us. What are you giving him a mishabeirach? What are you doing your whole haftorah? Give the guy, the, any, anybody getting a tip knows why they're getting a tip. When I tip, I take the money, fold it in a little thing, and just hand, like, a, like a love note. My dad was old school, pulled a wad of cash out of his pocket, hundreds, fifties, made the guy sweat it out, 20, 10, hit, okay, a five, you got a five. <laughs> Millennials don't know how to tip or how to receive a tip. Leo took me to Trader Joe's. Have you heard of this place? Yes or no? Have you been in Trader Joe's, sir? Never. He's never. I went in there. You walk in this place. I had a cart this big. We're walking around. I bought everything because everything's $1.69. I was in shock. I, never, I was amazing. I took two of this, three of that. Look at this. Frozen that, frozen that. I get to the cashier. Now, the cashier, they... had a cash register and a counter that was just six inch piece of plywood. You've been to Trader Joe's, you saw that. And I have a cart full, I looked like a Ukrainian refugee leaving. And this cashier took everything and put it, I was in shock the way he did it. It was beautiful, put everything out there. And not only that, friendly. Did you find everything you were looking for? I said, I found things I wasn't even looking for. <laughs> oh, I tried these. These are amazing. You'll enjoy them so much. I had a new best friend. Not only did he unpack everything into this little counter space, he then put it into bags that all weighed the same. It was magic. I was so impressed. I gave, I gave, I gave him a $20 bill. Had a panic attack. Ding, 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 ding. The fire department came. Two managers showed up. He's on the floor having a seizure. They go, what happened? I go, I tried to give him a tip. At the end of the day, I'm going to tell you, it was such an honor to be a part of this. You guys still awake or no? It was such an honor to be a part of this. Because I'm telling you, when you have Jewish events, sometimes there's a lull. It's like, this is on fire. 
Everybody was good. I, I'm telling you, I do Jewish events. You can't imagine. I did an organization called Bone Olam. Has anybody heard of this? Yes. They raise money for women with, with fertility issues. It's a Hasidic organization in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Not the cool part, that other part. The rabbi called me up directly and spoke to me in what sounded very much like English. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. My name is Rabbi Machnoch Kinder. And I work with organizations called the Bainer Oilam. And we work with women who are trying to get pregnant and we need your help. I could be there at 3.30. This hotel, do you, do you know what was missing from this Shabbat thing? Shabbos elevator. The Shabbos elevator. Matt, if you can do for next year, Shabbat toilets, but the Shabbat elevator. Now, I know some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. Do you know what a Shabbat elevator is? Yes or no? It's an elevator that stops on every floor during the Sabbath. Norm, are you with me on this or no? I know I've lost, this is too Jewish for you. This is, he's like, where'd they find the rabbi? The Shabbat elevator steps on every floor. Every floor. Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Whether you wanted to or not. And nobody can explain the Shabbat elevator. No, the biggest rabbis in the world. The big, it's not because you can't work. It's not the, when you press the it's not the first thing, but the Jews can't work on the Sabbath. So if you can, if you're breaking the fucking you know, now, <laughs> nobody can explain the Shabbos elevator. Nobody. And I'm going to tell you my theory. I believe the Shabbos elevator is what began World War II. <laughs> Picture this: Berlin before the war. Hitler and Goebbels go into a building. It's Friday night. They get in the elevator. And what kind of an elevator is it? It's a Shabbos elevator. At first, Hitler's in a good mood. Ah, oh, Gabbard, look at this. Someone has made a practical joke. And they have pressed all the buttons in the elevator. Nein, nein, mein Führer. She says, someone says, the Juden, the Jews. Why would the Jews quetch all the buttons in the elevator? Because they can't make an Arbeit on the Shabbos. What the Arbeit to quetch in the button? No, my Führer. She said, it's a quetch in the electrical connection. Machen von the Tira Reus in the Rhein. Get him in for the Reibe. No, my Stippen sind rein. By the time they hit the 39th floor, they were wrecked. Now, those of you that got that joke, Shkoyach. Good for you. And those of you who maybe didn't like that joke, oh. Now you have what to complain about. But keep in mind, those of you that complain, it's because of you, Mashiach can't come. Yes, Mashiach is, Mashiach is here. He's in this room. Come on. You feel it or no? Messi mess messianic energy. No. You guys have an, you guys, the, the power in this room can bring Mashiach. Bring the right person that treats people, the right candidate, that treats people with human dignity. You guys have that power. This is it. Am I, are you with me or no? Norm, clap your hands. Because this, this, this word here, Jewish, the number one goal before Republican or coalition is messianic energy. Yes. And this room can make that happen. What are you laughing? The richest table's laughing. I believe this room can make that happen. I feel it here. You guys can find the right candidate. They all came out here and pitched their story to you, huh? Did they or not? Come on. What an event. What an event. An unveiling. We had an unveiling. The ambassador came out here with that dress and the heel. Bam! I want to be president too. Bam! 
all of these, all of these, these, these Gentiles with the thick hair, except for one, poor thing. The thick hair. You have to understand now, listen, I, I, I love the, the non-Jews. We call them Goyim. Did you know that? It's a good word, Goyim. Non-Jews. It's not a bad word. It's the same word as Jew. Goy Jew, same thing. It's how you use it. My neighbor, he's Jewish. We spend all the holidays with them. It's absolutely lovely. Delicious and the music is great. Or my neighbor, the Jew, blocks my driveway every morning. Not nice. And I love, I love Goyim. I love watching them. It's all I watch on TV. It's all I watch on TV. I don't watch anything Jewish, only non-Jew. I love the crown, the royal goyim. <laughs> have you seen this show? When they have these big castles, uh-huh, and you look at it, and every Jew looks at those castles and goes, how can they heat that room? <laughs> what would you like with your tea? A space heater. That's all I want. They're frozen. That's why they live so long. I love watching them and learning them. When the queen died, oh my God, when the queen died, wow, I couldn't turn the TV off during her funeral. This, those of you who aren't Jewish, you should know when a Jew dies, we bury them, bam, right away. There's no, it, someone dies 24 hours in the ground. And it's a good idea because it's not going to get any better. In Florida, when the old Jews take a nap, they wake up, no, put the shovel away, it's just a nap. They schlepped this queen for 19 days. Did you see this? 19 days. They dragged her all over the country. They put her on this cart like they were going to sell belly bagelach in the Lower East Side. They threw a blanket on top of her and they schlepped her for 19 days. She traveled more during those 19 days than her whole reign of 80 years. Everything they told you, she's going to go to, uh, to Buckingham and Windsor and Sussex and Essex and New Jersey and Pittsburgh. It was like tracking an Amazon package. And the family's walking behind her, Bruges. They were all upset with each other. You saw that? Just walking miserable because, you know, they had a fight before, right? You could, you could tell they were all fighting before. They went through her drawers and grabbed whatever diamonds they can find. Yeah, Camilla, she's going, I'm the new queen. She found this diamond brooch this big. She walked, the sun hit it, she could start a fire. And Kate had that necklace. So that necklace that she had, it was like a, a diamond chandelier, beautiful diamond chandelier. And Nebuch, Megan, they gave her two pearl earrings from Zales. I love watching Goyim. I love them. I love performing here. I had the time of my life this weekend. Thank you all for making me a part of it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Matt, Norm, for having me here. You're all amazing. God bless you. God bless you. God bless Israel. And God bless America.